Okay, it's time, time to begin. Welcome to our first panel discussion concerning the Ukrainian economy, Ukraine business in the face of war. We will discuss more current issues of how Russian unprovoked aggression affected doing business in Ukraine, both in Ukraine and Poland, while the next discussion will, will be uh, about the future, about the libertarian prospects of, of re reconstruction of Ukraine. Let me introduce my honorable guest. First, Mr. Roman Vashchuk, who is a former ambassador of Canada to Ukraine and current business ombudsman for Ukraine. <laughs> then, Mr. Konstantin Magalecki, who is a vice president of IT Ukraine Association, and he was also a partner in private equity fund and, and investor both in Poland and Ukraine in IT sector. And last but not least, Martin Nowatsky, who is the vice president of the Union of Entrepreneurs and Employers, one of the largest employers organizations in Poland, and board member and Warsaw Enterprise Institute, a flourishing free market think tank that is also a partner of this weekend of capitalism. My name is Martin Zieliński, and I'm chief economist at Civil Development Forum, a think tank found, founded by Leszek Balcerowicz in 2007. <laughs> it's been almost 400 days since the Russian invasion on Ukraine. The Russian invasion turned upside down the lives of millions of Ukrainians and businesses were interrupted by, uh, and, and many productive assets were destroyed. Gross domestic product of Ukraine dropped by about one third in 2022, and even before the invasion, it was not very high. GDP per capita was just about one third of the Polish GDP per capita. And my first question will be just about the, will be about the past, will be about the conditions just before the war. We know that Ukrainian transition to market economy was not a success story, unfortunately. But after the revolution of dignity in 2014, things began, began to change. And, uh, and it appears that even it accelerated after Vladimir Zelensky was elected the president. Uh, my first question will be to, to Roman Vashuk. Uh, Business Ombudsman Council began its operations in 2015 to provide for greater transparency of business practices in Ukraine. I know that you are in the Ombudsman uh, since January 2022, but what is the experience of the institution led by you? What changed? Well, I have to be very careful uh, how I answer that question because my immediate predecessor is sitting in the front row, uh, Pan Marcin Świętsicki, uh, who was business ombudsman right before me. Uh, you know, Ukraine is a paradoxical place. On the one hand, it is considered uh, overregulated, uh, a bit behind other countries in terms of reforms. Yet on the other hand, uh, because of the uh, maybe late socialist Poland attitude in, in certain respects. Uh, I'm thinking of the gentleman yesterday who was talking about, we could do almost anything as long as the officials were okay with us. Uh, it, part of Ukraine is that attitude has continued to prevail. So uh, you have at the same time a culture of overregulation, and at the same time a fairly freewheeling entrepreneurial uh, spirit uh, especially in micro business and small business, uh, which are very lightly taxed, not covered by the VAT system, and provide scope for entrepreneurialism and, of course, also for shadow economy uh, evasion. So, uh, but I think we saw some of the classic problems uh, seen before 2014 declining. Uh, whereas we saw some new ones appearing. Uh, some of the, uh, the classic problems of corporate rating, you know, 
one evening you're the owner, the next morning some obscure notary has uh, signed your company over to somebody else. Uh, that was on the decline as both the Ministry of Justice and other authorities uh, tried to clamp down on these practices. But with, for example, the introduction of an automated VAT system, refund system, and then also a monitoring system, depending on who was in charge of the tax authority, we saw more and more problems pile up, especially for small and, uh, and medium business. Uh, our success rate in solving individual cases, about 68, 70%, depending on the quarter. Uh, so the, the, we don't have enforcement powers, but we have transparency powers, and to some extent, name and shame powers. And that, in it, just over two thirds of cases, works. Thank you. Constantin, uh, you are from the IT sector, and it may be surpri surprising for many, but Ukrainian IT sector was thriving before the war. It generated about 4% of GDP in 2021, and it, is, and it, it had huge prospects for f growth. What were the main factors ac accounting for it? Thank you for your question. So, yes, uh, first of all, for last year, uh, IT industry was probably the only one which continued to grow, and the growth was by some estimates around 10% in dollar terms year on year. Yeah? So it's, it's big numbers for Ukraine. It's more than seven, I think it's 7.58 billion dollars of uh, export of tech services last year, plus some uh, local market. Uh, and now, uh, tech services and export is like half of the total export of services from Ukraine. So. For Ukraine, it's uh, very big numbers. I think the reasons are why, uh, why we are succeeding in, in IT, relatively to other sectors at least, is because uh, we have very good, uh, <laughs> surprisingly, uh, and maybe like uh, Poland can relate to that as well. I mean, like, I'm very anti-Soviet, yes. I'm like University of Chicago graduate and so on, actually. I remember Mr. Batsirovich coming there 15 years ago was when I was a student at business school. <clears throat> but uh, in, in Soviet uh, times, the technical education was very strong. Yes, mathematics, engineers, and so on. I mean, it was more for military purposes, not for tech. So the first uh, computer in uh, Europe was created in Kiev, actually. Uh, so we have very strong engineering school. Uh, I can't say that Ukrainian, uh, independent Ukraine did much for it, uh, but uh, we still uh, have it thanks to the Soviet legacy. So that's one reason, very good education. And the uh, second reason, and it's actually in line with, uh, with what, what you are doing and discussing here, is that there is a very little government involvement in this sector, right? Uh, the government was more focused on natural resources and this kind of things with uh, a lot of uh, money uh, and a lot of government influence. In Tech, it's much harder to do because it's not so concentrated. There are no oligarchs and uh, the, the so-called administrative power uh, doesn't help much. So in that, uh, how the, you can say the capitalism, the free entrepreneurship, young generation created this uh, wealth and success. And now, actually, if you look at uh, Ukrainian Forbes, it's not uh, top 100 anymore because after the war, it's very hard to estimate uh, the wealth and business, but it's top 20 now plus uh, 10 candidates. In, and in this top 20, each third uh, entrepreneur is actually from tech sector. Uh, so it's like uh, if before like metallurgy was number one, energy was number two, and agriculture was number three, now it's actually IT sector which is number one in Ukraine. And I believe it's a great thing because this uh, with uh, having more influence in the country, when, when you have wealth, you have influence, let's be honest, it, it will be very helpful uh, for Ukraine. And that's where we can teach, we can help other countries in Europe in particular because when Ukrainians come into Europe, we appreciate a lot the support which we are getting here. My daughter was born uh, in Warsaw several months ago, so we are very grateful for all the support we are getting. But in terms of digital services, Ukraine is actually very, quite far ahead of uh, other countries in the region, despite they didn't have this tens of billion dollars, and our digital vice prime minister is only like uh, 30 years old. Yeah, now he's 32, but when he was started, he was not even 30. Yeah, so that's, I think, the key reasons for this uh, progress, yeah. 
was great to hear about the free entrepreneurship spirit. And now, in actually, the in terms of collaboration between Ukraine and Poland, because I am invested in both in Ukraine and Poland as a sector and have business uh, is there and here, it's actually like Ukrainian companies are diversifying into Poland, hiring people here. A lot of entrepreneurs are based here because it's much easier to travel from Warsaw, for example, into other. So I see a lot of synergies actually coming between Ukrainian and Polish uh, tech sector, and I'm sure we will see more and more results uh, soon. We will discuss the new links between Polish and Ukrainian firms later. So I, I will ask you about it once, once more. Uh, Martin, can you tell us how extensive was the cooperation between uh, Polish and Ukrainian firms just before the war? We know that it grew after, it started growing after the war, but what was the situation before the, 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 the Russian invasion? What was the, uh, what about Polish investment in, in Ukraine and trade between uh, Polish and Ukrainian economy? Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for, uh, for allowing me being here. So it was of course, I mean, we should look at it into, from two perspectives. One, SME sector, and second, large, uh, large businesses. Uh, of course, SMEs were super limited in terms of the presence uh, of both Polish SMEs in Ukraine and, and, and Ukrainian companies here in Poland. It's, we can easily check it, speaking to our colleagues, entrepreneurs, asking about their experiences, if they have any uh, in Ukraine, uh, really, you, can get a positive answer. In terms of large business, there were some sectors, of course, uh, where Polish companies uh, uh, used to be and still are active. Uh, construction materials, uh, construction sector as a, as a service as well. Uh, there are some large players uh, who, which really know Ukraine quite well. Uh, large retailers from Poland are active in the, in the whole uh, region, including uh, Ukraine, so the largest Polish brands you can find all over the places and shopping malls uh, in Ukraine. Of course, there was a um, uh, years back a Polish investment of the state-owned bank in Ukraine, uh, which also kind of uh, builds a kind of framework for, for companies understanding what's happening in Ukraine. I mean about, uh, about Credo Bank. Uh, so there are actions, activities, that there are a number of uh, like high-profile individuals who, are, who used to, uh, to be involved or still are involved in those kind of concentrated sectors uh, in Ukraine. So th there is a relationship, uh, especially uh, in terms of specific sectors uh, and understanding, uh, but it wasn't a kind of large-scale uh, activity or operations. So, so definitely now the, uh, the perspective we have is totally different because uh, we observe uh, medium-sized companies, even like micro companies coming to, uh, from Ukraine to Poland. And I hope it's going to be the case also uh, uh, from Poland to Ukraine uh, as, as, um, uh, as the situation uh, changes in, in the future. But even now we do events promoting uh, SMEs, uh, sellers on e-commerce platforms for both countries. So we introduced large e-commerce platforms from Ukraine to Polish sellers. Uh, and we do the same with large Polish-based Polish, uh, Polish -based platforms, such as Allegro or, or Amazon, to Ukrainian sellers. So this is the way we, one of the, the examples we integrate uh, and uh, allow individuals, companies to, uh, to get to know each other. It's super important that we build trust now. The momentum is on our side, I mean on our Polish-Ukrainian side, uh, uh, to, to build business trust, to, to have uh, uh, kind of the knowledge how things move in both countries. Uh, for now, of course, the interest is on the Polish market, uh, somehow to mitigate the, the economic downturn uh, of Ukraine. That's a natural process. Even a small company in Ukraine must internationalize right now uh, in a way to sustain and kind of, uh, you know, go forward with, with their activity. 
Uh, and hopefully those companies uh, experiencing now the Polish market will allow us, our companies, uh, our SMEs to enter Ukrainian market in the future. Thank you. The direct effect of war is, of course, obvious. It, the war, every war, leads to destruction of productive assets, to the destruction of economic potential. But this war led also to some regulatory changes, uh, and even deregulatory changes, but also to some new prohibitions because of martial law in, in Ukraine. And my next question will be about those new regulations and deregulations. Which new piece of legislation do you find the most beneficial for business and which most harmful? Constantina. I think I am here the least involved uh, <laughs> in the legislation among all speakers, but I think like the most important, uh, uh, my, my wife actually used to be deputy minister on ever integration uh, in Ukraine after revolution of dignity and she, uh, and she and the team back then, they actually did a great job in terms of signing free trade agreement with Poland uh, and the European Union in particular. Yeah, so I think that additional agreements which we had recently on these topics and the simplified transit, if I call it correctly, which was done last year, I think that's the most important uh, thing which is, uh, which is uh, happening now. Uh, and actually it works and actually would like to thank Martin and the PPF for their support, what they're doing, because if we speak with numbers and that's always the best indicator, Poland became last year the largest partner of Ukraine, right? Before it was China. So it's a remarkable and uh, change with a lot of positive signs. Yeah, unfortunately for not very fortunate reasons. And actually the trade grew in double digit uh, last year, yeah, despite the total grew uh, trade uh, decrease. So it's a big opportunity. I think actually another very positive thing happened on the Polish side with uh, Poland uh, allowing Ukrainians and as I understand Belarusians to some extent uh, to come here easily and so on. And now you have like I mean, in software development business, in online education for programmers, yeah? So we teach Polish and Ukrainian adults and kids coding, yeah? Because there is a deficit of programmers. And now, with having more Ukrainians and Belarusian programmers here, actually, Poland economy is uh, benefiting a lot because there are more startups, the programmers are in deficit, but now, like, there is less deficit, you can have more startups, more unicorns, and uh, so on and so forth. Because both of our countries, they don't, they together have less unicorns than one small Estonia, yeah? Actually, not much more than even Belarus. So I think there is like a lot of improvement which should be done in this regard. Thank you. Roman. For example, I, I, I read that some problem of, for Ukrainian firms uh, that started or moved their business to Poland was the uh, moratorium on cross-border foreign currency payments introduced by National Bank of Ukraine? Uh, yes, I mean, certainly for the first four or five months, the uh, moratorium on uh, the currency restrictions uh, became a problem because you ended up without necessarily wanting to in a de facto semi gos plan economy. Uh, one of the things we switched into doing, because we couldn't handle, uh, with the courts closed and state registers closed, standard business complaints, is we became a sort of free legal aid service for Ukrainian business. And one of the main things we did in the first four or five months of the war was document the need for additions to the critical imports list. Because what seemed critical on the 25th of February was very soon outdated. Take as an example, you know, let's say fuel is essential on the 25th, but by late March you realize you need tractor parts, otherwise there will be no spring sowing. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it is a good thing that thanks to more solid EU, US, and now IMF backing, uh, the currency restrictions have been, uh, have been lowered. Uh, allowing business to make more of its own sensible decisions and not not rely on the cabinet of ministers to think what particular small item is necessary for the continued operation of the national economy. Uh, so that, that is important. But I, I'd like to maybe just pick up on the sort of forced globalization or Europeanization of Ukrainian business. Uh, 
this is important. And for that business, Poland is the number one platform. If, if you just want to take a walk on Nowy Sviat, on one block you will see Lviv Croissant, you will see Piana Vishnya, and you will see Czarnomorka. So basically, Black Sea business, Western Ukrainian business, all on one block. Uh, and that's also true of manufacturing companies and others, because I think one, one of the things, apart from IT, Ukraine actually has developed quietly uh, something that I think that is similar to Poland, which is these sort of hidden champions uh, in manufacturing. Uh, there's a company in Lutsk that I think provides 20 or 30 percent of Europe's supermarket refrigeration equipment. Uh, so these people have been looking at. Let's put a let's put a uh, uh, a warehouse into Poland. Let's put a, an assembly plant into Poland. Uh, so what potentially you're looking at is a socio-economically integrated Polish-Ukrainian space. Uh, and the social rights that have been granted to Ukrainians in Poland have been reciprocated by the Ukrainian parliament. For Poles, naturally, not a huge number of people are streaming across the border to take advantage of them now. But for the reconstruction period, that is a comparative advantage for Poland and citizens of Poland, even compared to other EU countries. If I may quickly comment uh, to relate to this uh, Bitcoin uh, topic here, and I'm not a crypto guy, but actually uh, USDT is uh, very popular uh, in Ukraine as it comes to this, uh, all this. We, we can argue it's a good, bad thing or no, not good thing, but USDT is very popular in terms of uh, helping Ukrainian businesses uh, in this situation with the currency restrictions, yeah. Thank you. Martin, what is the Polish perspective of, on regulations and deregulations after the, the Russian invasion on Ukraine? So I would mention two moves, one at the Polish domestic level, second at the European level. So in Poland, of course, it was critical to, uh, to, to open our market, uh, for Ukrainians, uh, not just to freely enter the country, uh, as it was the case, it is the case for for the uh, for the EU, but also to allow them freely uh, open and run uh, businesses. So Ukrainian citizens can come and easily, basically, on the like day one, register the business, uh, regardless of the kind of fo legal format. Uh, you, you can simply uh, do it. And this decision was, uh, was really, really important. Uh, you can see uh, how fruitful uh, it was for, for Ukrainian uh, entrepreneurs. Second, it was a decision from May last year, 2022. And that decision uh, of, of uh, actually of the European Council to open the single market uh, for Ukrainian uh, companies and that decision of course um, kind of, it was the I think first decision ever of, the, of that kind where we basically uh, we get re we got rid of uh, all tariffs and quotas uh, for products from, from Ukraine of course the liberalization of of both markets was a process before it was happening so there were some and the whole list of products without tariffs uh, uh, entering uh, uh, single market, uh, but there were quotas. There were quotas for services like the transport sector. Uh, there was also a decision uh, uh, last year. It was even early in May uh, to to uh, to get rid of the quotas for the transport sector. It was prolonged actually last week, uh, and we are about uh, we are discussing now. Uh, in, in Brussels, the prolongation of the of the uh, 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 single market openness to, to Ukrainians. The decision was made just for one year, till early June, 2023. So we need to to uh, make this decision decision quite uh, quite soon. I think as long as the war continues, there is a consensus uh, in Brussels at member states level that uh, it will be it will be kept. It doesn't mean that Ukrainian products can uh, just easily, totally freely enter the, the single market. Uh, of course, they still need to meet uh, European standards and, and certificates. Uh, 
so this is happening. This is also a strong role of Poland, of, of our, our institutes, our businesses, to provide the, the service assistance in terms of getting those uh, certificates and, and standards uh, approvals. So that's one. But they do not need to meet those requirements in terms of uh, uh, production uh, capacity in Ukraine. So uh, there's nothing like the check from the European side to, to see what's the production uh, uh, format standard uh, in Ukraine. So we just needed the final uh, product. It even refers to animals and the food sector. So we don't go to Ukraine to check the uh, the sanitary uh, uh, standards. We we don't care about that. We check only the product as it enters uh, the EU. And even this is kind of limited because we only have a full uh, vet and sat check uh, on the border crossings for import to the EU, but if this is a transit going, f uh, going uh, through member states, you, you're not, um, uh, you, you, uh, you don't need to go through the, through the process. It was actually discussed two weeks ago here in Warsaw between uh, Minister Prime, Deputy Prime Minister Kowalczyk and Minister Mikola Solski, where the agreement uh, uh, was, uh, was, uh, uh, was done. So the transit is like totally free. You can enter uh, once you have the documents, papers, uh, so where you can uh, show and um, kind of make sure our border officials that it's a uh, transit, uh, then it's like totally uh, free. So those two, uh, those two major moves from Poland and the EU uh, was critical. We need to maintain this system. Although I know it creates lots of uh, um, tensions, it was the case for Romania last year or with the grain and agricultural products. This year it's a kind of political issue for some of the uh, people or, or farmers in Poland. But there is, a, uh, I think the, the majority of farmers, food producers in Poland, I know because we speak to them a lot. Uh, even when Mikola Solski came two, two weeks ago, before the negotiations with the Polish government on the food sector, agriculture, we met uh, him with Polish food producers, the, the large players uh, here in Poland, to make sure that both sides have a kind of similar understanding of the situation. So majority of, of business, uh, uh, businesses, but also farmers, large farmers, agree to what's happening. The tensions are natural because some of the, you know, the, the grain, uh, the agricultural product, is a, kind of, is a sensitive issue across Europe, not just in Poland, Romania, but France. So if there is a, 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 a really high supply of, of, of the product, especially initially last year, that was the case where everything was kind of welcomed. And we didn't, at that time, we didn't take care of, of the transit, whether it's transit or import it somehow creates uh, local uh, tensions. But um, I know from like both governments and businesses that, I mean, the, the kind of approach that is right now uh, in place will be kept for, for Ukrainian uh, companies, including agriculture. Okay, thank you. I have so many questions, but we are running out of time. I hope to ask you just one more and then I... I hope that uh, we'll have some questions from the audience. Uh, so, my last question is about your perspective on, on, on how the cooperation between Polish and Ukrainian business will be after what we all hope for, Ukraine wins the war. Will, Poland, will Polish business help in uh, rebuilding Ukraine and will Ukrainian firms expand to EU with the aid of their Polish contractors? What can be done to, to foster the cooperation? Martin. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to stress that from my perspective, but also my colleagues here in Poland and Ukraine, 
the, the process of reconstruction of Ukraine takes place right now. It's happening. I mean, you, you, can, you can visit every single oblast in Ukraine uh, and you see like roads, bridges, buildings under construction. It's happening. Of course, it is limited. Uh, uh, it is limited, uh, but there is lots of movement. Uh, that's that's one. Second is uh, that uh, right now, of course, the focus of Ukrainian business is, is mostly on the uh, single market, and Poland is the kind of uh, gateway to, to enter the single market. Uh, but there is lots of uh, cooperation. We have like dozens, like 50 plus companies right now served by our team. We have established uh, Business for Ukraine Center with Vincent PP with five uh, staff members fully deployed to serve Ukrainian companies. But it means uh, uh, we basically facilitate the partnership, cooperation, logistics uh, here in Poland, but also like you know, moving goods from, from Ukraine, transit, pro transit uh, via Poland, uh, engaging with Polish uh, harbors, uh, we allow Ukrainian companies to, to enter Polish retailers. Yesterday there was a, an exhibition of uh, Lviv fashion designers here in Warsaw. They presented themselves to the Polish uh, 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 boutique retailers and, and, uh, and, and fashion, uh, uh, fashion shopping uh, sector. So it's happening like a lot, and um, and our perspective is that this, those partnerships will end up in a similar kind of setup, operating uh, later on in in Ukraine. So I, when I see two, three companies, Polish, Ukrainian, even international companies, uh, uh, with a partnership here in Warsaw, Krakow, uh, other location. I'm pretty sure that those partnerships will work out in Ukraine uh, in, in the future. There are construction companies, Polish construction companies, looking at uh, specific contracts right now in, in Ukraine. Of course, we, we won't enter now with like full operations with, with our employees, uh, but we just had a meeting last uh, week about few buildings that must be renovated right now in, uh, uh, in um, Kharkov, and there are Polish companies willing to enter those bid school. I mean, they, are, they want to, to become uh, general contractors, of course, to deliver the service in cooperation with, uh, with local uh, companies, with Ukrainian companies. There are Japanese, Korean companies, engineering companies coming to us uh, to uh, asking for uh, the kind of finding a proper partner in Ukraine for them in order to, uh, to enter the construction process. So the, I think kind of the, uh, the ecosystem we're building now in terms of business to business cooperation uh, is critical to be effective, uh, efficient from also Polish perspective uh, uh, later on in Ukraine. Thank you, Konstantin. Will be very short as we're running out of time. So I think in tech, the integration and cooperation is already happening on the both sides. Uh, so I think it's clear here, and the synergies are obvious. I'm also working on launching Ukraine uh, Green, Green Ukraine Recovery Fund, and uh, I believe there is a very big potential in terms of Ukrainian recovery for Polish business because uh, Ukraine as a candidate to European Union has a lot to learn from Poland in terms of getting access to this money and to deploying this money. Yeah, Ukrainians don't have such experience, and it's actually really, it's, it's not an easy thing, yes? Uh, so I think like one of the biggest areas in terms of potential is uh, ex actually in partnering Ukrainian and Polish companies in terms of getting European money uh, for, for Ukrainian candidate uh, status, yes, and accession to the European Union and deploying this money for, uh, for the recovery of Ukraine. Okay, and thank you. And Roman, what is your perspective? Well, I think uh, the rebuilding of Ukraine, which is already starting now, will be Europe's and maybe the world's biggest construction site uh, for the next 10, 15 years. And 
Uh, Poland is right next to it. For the millions of Ukrainians who've been in Poland, for them, Europe or the EU is Poland. So they're familiar with Polish ways. They have become familiar uh, with Polish ways of doing things, usually good, sometimes problematic, uh, familiar with Polish brands, uh, familiar with, and share a similar mentality. Uh, so again, I think that is a comparative advantage uh, for the future. And I, I know there is a paranoia here in Poland that you know, we're gonna, we've done everything and then the Germans will come and they will take over all of Reconstruction and will be left sitting, crying, looking at all of this. Uh, you control the transit routes, for one thing. Uh, but the other thing is the goodwill that Poland has generated extends into the business community and it extends into the general population. And simply the mutual understandability that people have remembered now of Polish and Ukrainian, both literally and linguistically and figuratively, means that you'd have to screw up really, really badly to not have Poland be a major beneficiary of Ukraine reconstruction. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? I think that we can have two questions. Thank you. So uh, my question would be about, uh, you know, the, the problem that has been uh, for, for a long time about corruption, right? The, 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 the thing that we had in the 90s in Poland, right? So what do you think is the trajectory about this? How, to, how is the war affecting this trajectory? And what's the realistic, uh, w where is it possible that Ukraine will, then, will end up in terms of corruption, for example, like 15 years? Okay, Konstantin. Uh, yes, uh, obviously, like, uh, we as many countries in the world have a problem with corruption, yes, and unfortunately, uh, for a reason, yeah, but I think it's important to distinct, to dist and then I'm not denying that there is a quite a high corruption still, but it's also important to understand that uh, there is, like, uh, Russian propaganda behind, the, sometimes, not sometimes, but quite often, uh, behind some scandals which we have in Ukraine, like, for example, if like, should we think like about this Ukrainian corruption one year before the war? Yeah, Ukraine was all often portrayed as a failed state, corruption everywhere, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but let's look now one year past the war. Yeah, military of Ukraine is successful. Yes, it's it's not ideal. Yes, and uh, mistakes remain, but all in all. It's successful and well beyond expectations, right? Should we have had corrupted military forces, we wouldn't be where we are now. I think it's clear, yeah? Then let's look at energy sector, which is heavily government regulated. Uh, nuclear power is like half of Ukrainian electricity. It's also controlled by the government and so on and so forth, yes? Despite all the bombings and so on, there was recently an article in Economist, and everyone knows it, even without this article, that Ukrainian energy sector managed to succeed and go through the war successfully despite heavy bombings by Russia, right? In California, the richest state in the world, I mean, they have power disruptions without any war, yeah? Uh, and they can't do much about it. The situation is getting only worse. So what I'm saying is that there are a lot of problems in terms of corruption, but they are often exaggerated, and not just by Russians, but Ukrainians themselves, right? At the same time, we see that a lot of arrests were done recently in Ukraine and so on. There are different opinions whether some of them be fair or it's more like a political attack, but there is a progress. And the most important thing is that Ukrainians' tolerance for corruption after this war is zero, yeah? If, like, someone is getting caught with corruption and there is evidence, like, uh, people want uh, justice, yeah? And if you, they don't get justice, uh, no one <laughs> wants to mess with Ukrainians now, yeah? I mean, uh, the civil society, the people who were fighting, who lost their friends, uh, and so on. So I think this pressure from the people will be so strong that in the long run, in the short run, in the mid run, we will do a lot of progress in this I, regard. I think there is a strong civil society in Ukraine. Absolutely, yeah. And now it will be even stronger, yeah, after the war. Yeah, and w there were uh, some vice ministers dismissed in January, and it was due to, due to I think, yes, due, absolutely. due to civil like society. Some scandal, there were several scandals uh, recently, and each one is uh, uh, finished at least with... Uh, with uh, losing the position of the government, yeah, and criminal cases and so on, for sure. 
And that's actually also because what you mentioned, strong civil society and zero tolerance for corruption. And it's impossible that there you have a public scandal and someone stated the position. This is impossible now. Thank you. I, I can't intervene into like Ukrainian uh, policies, uh, but uh, let me share what is my message at the European level because th that issue is uh, heavily discussed and raised by an individual business member states even. Uh, so I think it's like fighting corruption is a process. We, we know it from the, because of, of our experiences here in Poland. Mm, uh, and uh, it should be also kind of a, a cause for us to, to motiv motivate ourselves, to mot motiv motivate the EU, Ukrainian government, Ukrainian people uh, uh, to somehow uh, go forward with the integration process. It cannot be, it cannot be an, ex an, an obstacle to, to open negotiations and start the integration process. Even look at uh, member states entering the EU, you know, in the 80s, uh, they were not free of, of corruption. Look at member states entering the EU in 2007. Up until now, they struggle with a number of uh, issues and political stability. Uh, we also struggle sometimes, from time to time, there are, there are issues. So, uh, that I think the momentum is here. We should use corruption also as the way to somehow push our colleagues, other member states, uh, 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 for integration. And this is critical. We need to use the momentum uh, of, of the war to open negotiations with Ukraine. Because corruption is one of the issues raised by some member states, uh, which are, for now at least, uh, opposing this, this process, to uh, the decision to happen. And we should have a totally different uh, uh, approach to, to, to the problem. Thank you, Roman. I would agree that uh, essentially Ukraine needs positive incentives to continue making progress. I think what we've seen in the Western Balkans is that if you're kept forever in the waiting room, uh, then sort of social pathologies multiply. Uh, Ukraine's internal motivation, and Konstantin talked about this, uh, people coming back from the front don't want to see corruption. Uh, and the external impulse of integration and the need to meet corporate partners' integrity requirements, uh, whether it's Polish companies, other European companies, international companies, and the expectations of the international financial institutions for the reconstruction process, all of these can be game changers in, uh, uh, in moving Ukraine forward. Uh, I'd mention, of course, that uh, a lot of what passes or is considered corruption in Ukraine is actually sort of on the edge business practices in other countries. Uh, it, campaigning against corruption in Ukraine has been so intense that, uh, you know, practices that prevail in North America, uh, somebody's relative is on some board, etc., uh, in Ukraine are immediately lumped into the corruption category. Uh, so th there's, a, there's a sense in which Ukraine is a victim of its own zeal in creating public institutions and NGOs that spend all their time ensuring that every foreigner thinks about the word corruption when they think about Ukraine. There's a lot more to the country than that. Thank you. Okay. Just one, but very quick question. Um, uh, my question is to uh, our Polish colleague. Um, Ukraine is uh, trying to, um, to get closer to Europe as soon as possible to, to get a membership. Uh, what uh, should Ukraine be ready? Three most important things uh, on the path to, uh, to uh, join in European Union. Uh, from your Polish uh, experience. And for Ukrainian colleagues, um, what do you think uh, the Ukraine needs the most uh, today to actually uh, speed up that uh, process uh, from the Western community and internally? Just one minute for everybody for the answer. Wow, that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, so, I think... Uh, 
right now we need uh, another significant political decision. Uh, we understand, I mean, I fully understand that the war continues. Your efforts are mainly, uh, you know, on, on the issue of fighting the, uh, the invader. Uh, but uh, the integration process is kind of aside, it's happening. Uh, it can't move like really smoothly and in a fast track uh, 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 mode, but you know, it's happening. The thing is that there are some member states who somehow we simply don't, who don't see the, 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 the war as, as significant or the integration as the kind of prospect for, for, for the EU. And uh, I think that uh, Ukrainian business uh, some of the politicians should look at those countries. I don't want to list them, but it's kind of uh, uh, easy to, to realize what countries are not uh, looking at Central Eastern Europe as a major uh, 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 political issue. And uh, we need to start lobbying right now in coming weeks, months, uh, uh, to make it happen. It's gonna, there's going to be a, a in a couple of months, the second, the third report of the EU integration process, the last one was um, early March uh, on Ukraine. So you can go very detailed and see what's the, what's the progress, uh, what's lacking. Uh, that, that's one. But the decision of, uh, about opening negotiations with the EU will be at the council level. So member states must decide and be coherent on on that, so I think as you did a tremendous campaign last year about the, mem the candidate status, uh, it was seen. I mean, there were uh, it was difficult in Brussels, in other capitals, to to say uh, that I oppose this um, the, the, the member the candidate status for for Ukraine or, or for Moldova. It was politically uh, incorrect. And I think we need to do the same in terms of opening negotiations, because if we don't do it now during the war, it's going to be super hard once the war stops. Because of those member, those list of this list of member states uh, that don't sim simply don't see that the enlargement should take place uh, uh, here in the in the region. Uh, I think that's number one issue for all of us including business, to go and, and discuss uh, the, the issue with, with our colleagues. The good thing is that as you have the access to the single market, we can easily show, perhaps the, uh, I would just exclude the agricultural sector, but we can easily show to our colleagues, to, to individual businesses in Europe, that it is not harmful for them in terms of competitive position, um, they, are, they were used to be always afraid of a large country entering the EU, the single market. I mean, it has happened and nothing really... Martin, I am afraid that I have to interrupt you. Uh, we are out of time and I think our Ukrainian colleagues wish to answer to just, just two minutes. Half a minute. The biggest uh, thing which we need now from the West, in my view, is that uh, the most now everything now all money goes to the government and public sector this proportion should change private uh, sector should start uh, getting some support as well because in the long term the success of ukraine fully depends from the private sector and now it gets very little support and attention and uh, now i'll contradict my, myself somewhat uh but what ukraine needs to do, to do is to ensure that formal and informal governance are aligned so that the person who's supposed to be doing a job like minister of the economy is the person who decides on the economy and not somebody in another office who influences the economy more than others so align those two and your conversations with other countries will go a lot easier thank you i i, I encourage all of you to ask the questions to our speakers just after the, our discussion in the hall, for example, and now I invite you to, to the next uh, speech on good coffee and good capitalism. Thank you very much.